Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shears, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and the disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus knowing that everything was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, then let these men go. This was to fill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup? That the Father gave me. So the band of soldiers the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold. 
and they were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately, the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled, so they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have brought him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, we do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, 
You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you're not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and, carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the Place of the Skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, from the top down. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be, in order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not, they, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. 
an eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you may also come to believe. For this happened, so that the scripture passage may be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now, in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We have several crises in the world today, and one of the biggies is the crisis of faith and hope. Uh, there are many people in the world who look at all the world's problems and they say, if God is all good, if God is all loving, if God is all powerful, then the world should look a lot better than it does. But the world has a lot of big problems. Therefore, God, at least the Christian God, does not exist. And uh, those people and many others uh, live without faith, they live without hope and they can take others uh, along with them down that journey of despair and doubt. We look at the cross of Jesus so we might say what others said in the gospel. If he's really the Son of God, how could this have happened? If God is really his ever-present Father, then how could the death of his Son have been allowed to happen? And, you know, it's not really a bad question. It's not a bad question at all. But it does bring to mind certain questions and ideas. The first and the foremost is this. If we think that this world here on earth is supposed to be perfect, a utopia, heaven, perfection, and all bliss, if that's what life here is supposed to be, then we really have no choice but to live each day in constant dissatisfaction, in constant anguish and worry and bitterness. The problem with that idea of earthly bliss is that it doesn't reflect reality. It's fantasy. If for no other purpose, the cross serves as a reality check for us. While God made this world wonderful and to be lived in and enjoyed, and we should enjoy it, the reality is that there's something more in store. And while we're waiting for that something more to come into being, we have choices about how to live in this life. One of the biggest and uh, hardest decisions we have to make is whether or not to accept the reality of sin and fallenness in this world. It's like when somebody says, comes to the confessional with the same sin over and over and over again. And they say, Father, I'm tired of coming here with this same sin over and over. I just cannot seem to get rid of it. And when I hear that, I'm reminded of some wise words of the priest who taught me about the Sacrament of Reconciliation. He said, sometimes confession is a way not to get rid of a particular sin, but to manage it. Sometimes confession is a way not to get rid of a particular sin, but to manage it. And what God sees is that person relying on him to manage that sin. Now, it might sound a little bit like encouraging somebody to give up when it comes to a sin they struggle with. But that's not it at all. It's encouraging a person to accept the reality of his or her own fallenness. God did not destroy sin. He didn't destroy the devil. But on the cross, the Lord broke the chains that bind us to sin and fallenness. Sin is still there, but we're not 
absolute slaves to it anymore. Right now we struggle with COVID-19, but the struggle isn't just with the virus that causes COVID-19. The struggle is also uh, social and economic. When are we going to be free again to travel, to work, to just have a conversation, a casual conversation with somebody again? Some people have suggested that we won't be free again until there's a vaccine, something to get rid of COVID-19. And you know, that's kind of a scary thought. For instance, there's no vaccine for the common cold. And humans have had those viruses around, uh, floating around since forever, but we managed to live with those viruses. We go about life. Take the HIV virus that's been around since the 1980s. People at the time were really very scared of that virus because it was pretty much a death sentence if you were to get it. And you know, we still don't have a vaccine for that. There's the HIV virus floating around still today, but we manage it. We learn to live with it. The Epstein-Barr vi uh, virus is another one. Even the virus that causes polio is still floating around in parts of the world. We've come to accept that these uh, evils, these viruses, are part of the world we live in. And so when will we get back to being free again, to be the social creatures that we're made to be? Well, my guess, my assumption, would be that when we get to a point when the COVID-19 virus can be managed, not eradicated, but managed, even without a vaccine. It would be nice to live in a world where there are no viruses, but of course that's not reality. It's not reality. It would be nice to live without sin as part of our lives. But again, that's not reality either. Sin is here, and it affects us and the whole world every single day. The good news, however, in that is that God has given us a way to manage that sin. If sin is like a lion, think of a circus, if sin is like a lion, God has given us a whip and a chair to manage it. And what God has given us is the cross of Jesus. When sin gets us down, we go to the cross. We say, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he does. When we're like the repentant thief, we say to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he does, and he will. The cross doesn't get rid of sin, but it breaks the chains that bind us to sin. And so on this Good Friday, we can say thanks be to God for the wondrous gift of the cross of Jesus. By it, by the cross. We can live in this world, beautiful as it is, wonderful as it is, fallen as it is. We can live in this world, not with constant complaining or fear, but with a healthy amount of satisfaction and peace. A preview of the ultimate satisfaction and peace in our heavenly destiny. My brothers and sisters, we now offer to Almighty God our solemn prayers this Good Friday for our good and the good of the whole world. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, 
Watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our Lord and God, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop David, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all catechumens, that our Lord and God may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, Increase the faith and understanding of all catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gathered what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith, and united in the bond of charity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love, and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, the freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, a comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus epidemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to persevere in faith. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on our world brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we prepare now to remember and adore the saving act of Jesus Christ, we welcome his holy cross into our midst. salvation of the 
Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Behold, the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my room, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Son, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And bow down now for the blessing. May abundant blessings, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people, who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord.